Well, listen, everybody, welcome to the Whitlam Institute within Western Sydney University and to the lovely Female Orphan School. My name is Leanne Smith and I'm the director of the Institute and uh, on behalf of all of the staff and volunteers at the Institute, we're thrilled to have you all here. We're also thrilled to have, you know, a full house for uh, this curator's talk for what is um, probably one of the most important exhibitions we've had in several years. Um, for the Whitlam Institute, this exhibition is the culmination of um, a lot of hard work, the discovery of just one of the treasures we have in the Prime Ministerial Collection, the folio that was gifted to Gough Whitlam in 1979. Um, and it's an opportunity for us to do a lot of what we're, we're trying to do at the Institute, which is engage with community, bring in kids, um, take the opportunity to demonstrate the contemporary relevance of the Whitlam policy agenda, and I think everyone here would agree that the arts and democracy is certainly a contemporary issue for us today in Australia and around the world. And also as a, an opportunity to use an exhibition like this to launch some policy dialogue around that very topic. So we're expecting to have a Whitlam legacy paper out later this year by Kim Williams about the Whitlam legacy in the arts. And we'll hopefully start some conversations with anyone interested about how we can promote the importance of the arts to a healthy democracy. So that's what it means for us, and I hope some of you have had a chance to have a look around the building at the, the permanent exhibition of the collection, um, and at also some of the beautiful history in this building from the female orphan school days through to the psychiatric hospital days. It really is a privilege to work in this space. So with that said, I'd just like to introduce you all to our curator, uh, who's very glad to come back again this afternoon after our opening last month um, to talk to you about the work you'll see upstairs. Guy Betts um, has curated not just this exhibition for us, but three prior exhibitions. Um, one of those is still touring around Australia, and I'll be going up to Grafton in a couple of weeks uh, to tour it there. It's called The Way of the Reformer, and it's about Gough Whitlam's early life and the influences on him that led to his influences on us as a country. Um, so we've worked a lot with Guy, and this collaboration has been, like all the others, an absolute delight. Um, he's a wonderful curator. He has a lot of deep knowledge about this topic in particular. And I'm sure you'll agree, once you've seen the work upstairs, he's put together just a fabulous exhibition. Guy is primarily affiliated with the Australia Council these days, but also does a lot of other consulting uh, for different organisations. And so we're just one of the partners who are very happy to work with him. Guy, please come and join us. Thank you. So good afternoon and, and thank you for all making the trip um, to Parramatta this afternoon. And thank you, Leanne, for the, uh, the warm introduction. Um, it's always a pleasure to work with the Whitlam Institute and it's, it's a privilege to, to share its stories and share its collection. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet today, the, the biomedical people of the Darug Nation, and I'd like to extend my respect to elders past, present and emerging. So the, the centerpiece of this exhibition is a folio of, of 16 artworks, basically. So the name of the exhibition dedicated to the dedicated is taken from the inscription of that exhibition. I'm sorry, the inscription in the, uh, it's been a folio itself. And that those words effectively establish a duality. It establishes um, the parties who are dedicated to someone who is dedicated to them. So it automatically establishes um, a reciprocity, a mutual admiration, a mutual respect. And that's the, the core exploration of the exhibition itself. So um, it was dedicated to the Whitlams, Margaret and Gough Whitlam in 1979 as Gough Whitlam was departing the political stage. So he had effectively resigned from Parliament in 1978 but formally left um, in later that year. So this was a gift as he was leaving and moving into the next stage of his life. Um, it's, uh, it's a folio of 16 artworks who shared works from across their career. A number of the works are from the period immediately after the, the dismissal, some are from before, and some are from even before he was leader of, of the Labour Party. So it's an assemblage of works from across their own careers, but, but most of them date from sort of the late 1970s, most between 1978 and 1979. So it's really, it's a roll call of some of the most esteemed artists of their generation. So there's Arthur Boyd, David Boyd, Hermia Boyd. I'm not going to read them all out, but uh, and you can see them all upstairs for yourselves. Um, there's not really a curatorial sort of a premise to the, the, 
portfolio itself, but the binding idea that's behind it is the mutual respect and admiration that they all had. And each of these artists were members of the Artists Action Collective. Um, so we'll come back and talk about that a little bit later. But at the core of it, 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 it doesn't try to express an argument as a folio. It's, it's, it's purely just the admiration towards Gough Willem himself. So it's a heartfelt gesture, a meaningful and intimate and thoughtful expression from these artists towards Gough Willem. So really it's the embodiment of a relationship. So it's significant because of the status and the, and the accomplishment of these artists themselves, but the greater significance of the folio is is basically as the embodiment of that relationship. So the central question of the exhibition is, why were these artists so grateful to Gough Whitlam? What was on the other side of that equation? Um, so I'll just, so this is the, the second page of the folio where most of the artists have inscribed their signatures to it. Um, and you can see each of these works upstairs, obviously. This is the Hermia Boyd work, Women on the Beach at Troy, um, Study for Bird Ritual by John Coburn. This is Adam and Eve by David Boyd. Um, and, and this is a work by Graham Inson. Of the Harbour from Cap Cove. And Boats in the Bay by Lloyd Reese. Bird by, from 1977 by the artist Peter Upwood. Meeting Point by Louis James from 1978. But to return to what I was saying, the, um, the, the, so, uh, so effectively the exhibition is based on a duality. It's based on um, what did Whitlam do for artists and why, um, and what did these artists do for Whitlam in return? What was the nature of the reciprocity that was there? So in order to answer the second question, we really need to answer the first. So the Whitlam agenda for the arts um, arose in a policy environment in which there was very little government intervention in the area of cultural policy. What support there was for the arts was very, very ad hoc, very inconsistent and very, very unstrategic in many ways. So um, the arts had really never enjoyed a particularly high uh, standing in the priorities of, of, of governments up until the time of Gough Whitlam really. Um, so the arts landscape in Australia in, in the 1950s and 60s is not one you could really describe as being, being thriving. It's often described as being stultifying and limited in its outlook and limited in its opportunities. Um, so the life of artists and writers and musicians and composers and other creative people during this time was, was exceptionally difficult. And for that reason, um, so many artists um, um, left Australia at a, a stage of their development, of, of their creative development, um, in basically in seeking more support overseas or more nurturing environments, basically. And then in 1972, the Whitlam government is elected, and it was arguably the first government to have a specific arts policy. Um, the program, as Whitlam described it, prescribed a number of very significant reforms and initiatives in the arts that should be mentioned. It's, it's, also, it's, it's also worth mentioning that the majority of these reforms actually remain in place. If you look at the, the breadth of the Whitlam agenda, um, it's, it, it's in arts policy really that, it, that you can say that the vast bulk of it remains in place as you know, it was originally legislated. So um, I'll list a few of them here. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but, um, but, the, but the construction of the National Gallery of Australia and the development of its collection was a significant development. Um, the introduction of local or content requirements to support the Australian screen and music industries, the, the creation of the Australian film and, 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 TV, um, and, and TV school in Ryde was another significant development. The creation of Double J, which is Triple J now, to support youth culture and Australian music. Um, and this is uh, the MIDI minister, Moss Cass, looking very much one of the kids <laughs> um, in, in, at the studios of Double J um, in King's Cross in 1975. Um, the introduction of FM radio, the introduction of public lending right for authors, the beginnings of the Cultural Gifts Program and the creation of the Australian Film Commission that led to the flourishing of Australian film, a renaissance that's often described as the new wave of Australian cinema. 
Um, but overall, the signature reform was the creation of the Australia Council for the Arts as a statutory independent agency to support the arts in Australia. Um, there were agencies that performed similar roles, but, it, but as I say, they were quite disorganised, quite inconsistent, and support available for individual artists was incredibly minimal and inconsistent across art forms. So the Australia Council was really a, a, a revolutionary development in cultural policy in Australia. Um, this is the first meeting of this uh, until the Australia C Council for the Arts um, at Kirribilli House in 1973 with Gough Whitlam in the front and a, a number of other people that are recognisable, I'm sure, like Nugget Coombs, for example, um, and David Williamson at, at the back, the playwright. Um, so the Australia Council for the Arts, the thing that, that, that made it distinctive was that compared to the agencies it replaced, it put artists themselves at the centre of decision making. Um, Whitlam was quite concerned um, with a number of developments overseas where, where governments, well-intentioned governments had created um, ministries of culture where the government itself dictated taste basically, and, the, and the, the views and tastes of a, a small minority of people dictated what was supported by, by the state to the, the country in its entirety. So instead of this, the Australia Council was created with, with, um, with seven art form um, boards, so the Visual Arts Board, Music Board, the Theatre Board, Film and, 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 and Screen Board, the Dance Board, Literature Board, and Aboriginal Arts. And I think it's it's really important to mention the impact of the of the Aboriginal Arts Board on Aboriginal culture at this point in time, um, because the creation of an Aboriginal Arts Board to put it on the same standing, the same level as those other art forms, um, that seems today like an entirely uncontentious thing. To our eyes, that seems utterly uncontentious. But in the 1970s, when racist and ignorant attitudes towards Aboriginal people and Aboriginal art and culture was still quite mainstream, um, and there was still a widespread view that Aboriginal culture was in a state of irreversible decline, a, a racist and ill-informed view, it was a radical thing to create an Aboriginal arts board whose task it was to invest directly in cultural revival and cultural maintenance projects. Um, it's, also, it's also significant, because, and this is an image of the, the Aboriginal Arts Board um, in June 1975. Um, it's also really important to note that this was um, amongst the first, if not the first instance of, of, you know, of self-determination being integrated into the machinery of government. This was really one of the first real instances in which Aboriginal people had been given a direct say in how government money would be spent, not for them, but by them. That was a really significant development. Um, it was also a time when there was, um, there was a, a very underdeveloped commercial art market for, for Aboriginal art. Um, so where there was no commercial art market, the Australia Council itself directly bought works from Aboriginal communities and Aboriginal artists. And when the major galleries and museums around Australia weren't particularly interested in displaying that work, the Australia Council itself organised international exhibitions that generated international interest in Aboriginal art and culture, as well as domestic you know, interest and engagement. And that, and that was a really significant thing. So rather than situating Aboriginal cultural expression on the periphery of Australian society, it brought it to, it, it aimed to bring it to the, the core of Australian identity at a really important moment in the development of Australia's cultural identity. So across all art forms though, um, the support for the arts was increased on a, a very significant level. So um, in its first year, the Australia Council received $14 million, which today doesn't sound like much, but um, that was more than twice the amount of, of support that the agencies it replaced received. So it was a doubling overnight in support for the arts by the federal government. The support was increased by, by half again in 1974. So it's, it's, easy to, it's easy for the numbers, as significant as they are, to obscure the real story. But the, um, but the Australia Council's grants were amongst the, the first gestures of direct support from the Australian government to individual artists. They were, were paid to do their work for the first time very often and um, 
the work that they did was was given a value both in symbolic terms and financial terms. And again, this this it sounds uncontentious to us now, but but artists growing up in an environment where they had been used to leaving Australia in, in order to find any kind of reward for their work, this was a really significant development. So what that meant was that there was a reversal of this outbound tide, basically. The tide of, of great Australian artists leaving as soon as they reached a certain level began to reverse and you had artists returning to Australia and you had artists beginning to see a future for, the, you know, for their own careers in Australia. So these grants meant more than just dollars in a bank account. It, it was an endorsement of the legitimate um, role and place of artists in society and a vote of confidence in the work of artists um, and a vote of, of confidence expressed by the Australian community through the Australian government. So Whitlam was arguably the first Australian Prime Minister really to lend the prestige of that office to the arts. He was the first to raise it to that, that standing. Um, and he was utterly unapologetic in, in doing that. He was enthusiastic in doing that. And um, no exhibition about Gough Whitlam and the arts would be complete without a reference to Blue Poles, of course. So um, that, that's, that's come to be a metaphor for his relationship with the arts. So as, as most of you would be aware, uh, in 1973, Gough Whitlam authorised the purchase of Blue Poles, the abstract expressionist work by Jackson Pollock for $1.1 million. A furor ensues, of course. Um, but it, was, um, but it was a fight that he was absolutely up for and absolutely, uh, absolutely enjoyed and reveled in, really. And just as a little indication of this, um, when Gough Whitlam arrived in office at the end of 1972, his Christmas card had already been chosen for him by the Department of, of Prime Minister and Cabinet. <laughs> and so he didn't have a say in what the Christmas card was going to look like. Um, this was their choice. So it's, it was uh, a colonial scene by Conrad Martins from uh, 1840. Very placid, very uncontentious, very safe. Um, in 1973, with the furor of, um, of Blue Pong still circling around him, uh, Gough Whitlam made a, um, a very different choice uh, and put Blue Pong's on his... <laughs> His Christmas card himself, <clears throat> and, and th this actual Christmas card is in the permanent collection that you can that you'd see on the other side of the building. The thing that I love about this is that he not only he couldn't resist using that painting on that Christmas card, but he had to point out that it was acquired in 1973 as well. <laughs> he had to make the point. Um, so why did Gough Whitlam support and identify and value the arts to the degree that he did? Um, it's true that he did have a lifelong association with the arts. Um, he wrote his own prose and poetry from a very young age. This is, this is um, an example of his poetry, the last stanza of a poetry. <laughs> to a work uh, he wrote in, at the age of about 16 called Youth and Tradition at the time that he was living in Canberra. Um, and this is, this is um, a part of the Whitlam, this is a, a, a part of the Whitlam collection as well. Um, this image here is in the exhibition upstairs, and if you look at the back row on the right-hand side, this is Gough Whitlam in the Tilopia Park High School Dramatic Society. So for someone who was actually in some ways quite um, withdrawn in his own way, he absolutely enjoyed the stage, and you could probably argue that his, the degree to which he enjoyed being part of the theatre set him um, you know, in good stead for a lot of political life. Um, this image here is from the National Film and Sound Archive. Gough Whitlam, this is not known by many, but Gough Whitlam appeared in the Ken Hong film The Broken Melody in 1937 as an extra. And this is him in a nightclub scene. It's a very, very, very minor role, but he enjoyed it, I'm sure. Um, it was also through th um, the stage that he met his wife, Margaret. So this is a, um, a program that is in the way of the reformer. Um, and you can see that Gough Whitlam plays the role of Noel Coward um, and Margaret Dovey is also in the cast. So they, they met effectively through the City Union Dramatic Society and Margaret said that it was the theatre that, that brought them together and theatre that kept them together. 
So there was a, um, a shared environment that, that was, the, that was a, a strong thread throughout their relationship. This program is in the exhibition upstairs. It shows them on stage again four decades later as the co-narrators uh, to the Carnival of the Animals by the Sydney Symphony Orchestra at a concert in 1987. Um, so there were lifelong theatre and art gallery and concert goers. But to go from direct personal interest to national interest, um, it's, it's really important to remember the broader context of Australian society at the time that Whitlam came to power. Um, the reference points that Australia had for its cultural identity were no longer sustainable at that point. So the, Euro so the UK had joined the European community in 1973. So the old idea that Australia had clung to in the minds of many people as an outpost of, of, of the UK um, was, was coming on a greater question. It, it, was, it was questioned more and more. It was, it was ultimately unsustainable. Um, there was a rising realisation that Australia would need to engage more deeply with its regional neighbourhood, both on a cultural level and an economic level as well. There was also a gradually there was also a gradually broadening appreciation and respect of the richness of Indigenous culture as a new element in Australia's idea of itself at this point. Um, another, um, another ingredient in this transformation, you could argue, were the women's rights movement, the peace movement, the gay rights movement, the land rights movement, amongst others, were challenging the conservative consensus that had, had, um, had, you know, had broadly dominated Australian culture throughout the 1950s and 1960s. So, it, it, so there was a, there was a real um, you know you know a transformation that was going on in Australian culture at the time that Whitlam arrived in office um, that needed to be nurtured in this new idea of Australia that needed to be expressed. Um, it's too much to suggest that the Whitlam government itself was the source of that transformation, um, but certainly the election of the Whitlam government was absolutely a reflection of it, and certainly it actively sought to enable artists to give a voice to that transformation. So it, it was actively supporting the arts directly and explicitly to support the creation of a new Australian identity, a radically different Australian identity. So the way that we have represented this in the exhibition is through this catalogue uh, of the Brett Whiteley work, Alchemy. So this work you might have seen in, in the Brett Whiteley studio in, in Surrey Hills. Um, it's a, it's an, epic work by any, uh, by any measure. Uh, it's 16 metres long and it's a kind of explosion of f feelings and, and reactions on the part of Brett Whiteley. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of masterful, um, you know, a representation of the flux that was going on in his own life, in Whiteley's own life, as well as in Australian society itself in, in this time. So the name alchemy you could take to, to refer to the alchemy you know, of the period of the 1970s itself. It was a period when, when everything was going from one state, one form, one certainty into another form or certainty. So the reason it's in the exhibition is that uh, the front cover, um, uh, the image that Whiteley chose was actually uh, the picture of Gough Whitlam standing on the Great Wall of China in 1971 on this absolutely revolutionary trip that he took there that absolutely upended Australia's relationship with China, with Asia and the rest of the world. Um, so it was a journey that, that would have seemed impossible until it had been done um, and a journey that absolutely changed Australia's direction in foreign affairs. So to me, the catalogue reflects Whiteley's own awareness of Whitlam as a political alchemist of sorts. Um, so for Whitlam, the arts community was not to be used simply to decorate national life. Um, the arts weren't, weren't just an indulgence. They weren't uh, a form of recreation. It wasn't light entertainment. The arts are, to Whitlam, um, an essential part of, of civil society and democracy itself. So Whitlam went so far as to, as to raise the arts to the same level of priority in the social democratic compact with the people as education and health. In fact, he said that you know, education and health are means to an end, and the, the end is a society where, you, where individual citizens can fulfill themselves and express themselves creatively. Um, so he introduced the arts into the social democratic formulation and program for the first time, and that was a very significant development. But aside from 
but aside from that, he also saw the contribution of the arts as being you know, an essential ingredient in the, the, the workings of a democracy. So he saw a thriving art sector as the guarantor of skeptical thought in Australia and a catalyst for social progress. And these are some of the quotes uh, that we've included in the exhibition upstairs in a kind of a ribbon of text um, in the third gallery. And they come from a speech that Gough Whitlam gave uh, two weeks after the, the dismissal in 1975 at the artist's concert. So it was a concert that was staged to raise money to support the re-election of the Whitlam government. And he talks about um, the role of, of, you know, of artists in supporting democracy and vice versa. So from the outset, um, you know, it, the, the striking thing for me is really that for someone who had such strong views on art himself as a participant, um, he actively sought to divorce himself from influence over it. So from the outset, he wanted to make sure that the, that the government's support for the arts wouldn't, wouldn't lead to the creation of a ministry of, of culture that would be heavy-handed. So he, he, so he didn't want an environment where only st state-sanctioned art would flourish. So that's the reason that he put you know, artists themselves at the heart of decision-making in, in arts policy and funding. So this liberated um, the arts to be free of state censorship while also allowing the state uh, to support art that would be directly critical of it, which is an essential thing. So it, it, it goes without saying that mm, this is a freedom that shouldn't be taken for granted even today, and there's still very much live questions, I think. So the artists of Whitlam's own time in the main you know, appreciated the financial and institutional support that was provided. Um, but over and above that, it was also the prestige and legitimacy that, that the arts were given through these reforms, the vote of confidence. Um, but there was more than just appreciation from afar. There was concrete and meaningful support as well. Um, so at each of the three elections contested by Whitlam, between the years of 1972 and 1975, the arts community mobilised on a grassroots level to support him. So there were a number of these groups around Australia, loosely organised, um, but a number. Of, but, but you can include Artists Action, Artists for Whitlam, Artists for Labor. The membership and structure of these groups evolved significantly over time, but their objectives were the same overall: the defence of the Whitlam government and its cultural policy. Some of the actions that they engaged, and, and this is an image, incidentally, of the Artists Action Collective who were responsible for the folio that's the centrepiece of this exhibition. Um, so some of the actions that they embarked on, um, they, uh, they auctioned their artworks and donated the money raised to support the re-election of Gough Whitlam and the Labour Party. They staged rallies and concerts to raise money and, and to generate momentum and publicity. Um, this is one of the posters um, that, that I'm referring to, and this is in the exhibition upstairs. And um, it's worth looking at the, at the names on the left-hand side. It's broken down by art form, but the, it's the signatories and the participants in this campaign, and they're amongst the most significant composers, writers, um, and visual artists, um, um, and theatre makers as well. The composers... Um, that are listed here um, are actually the, it, it, the inspiration for the music that accompanies the, the exhibition upstairs. So the, the music that's in the exhibition is, it, it is, is derived from this list of composers and music that was composed at about this time as well. So they, they, um, they staged these rallies and concerts and took out ads in newspapers and posted in the streets to, to, to campaign for the return of a Whitlam government. Um, one of the, yeah, and, and, and this is um, an event that was staged uh, not long after the dismissal at, at the town hall in Paddington. Um, uh, a particularly noteworthy participant, I think, is Patrick White. And I, I say that because he had been relatively conservative in, you know, in his outlook in a political sense for most of his life. So um, I think it's, it's, um, it's important to, to see the effect um, of, of the leadership of Whitlam in e extending the appeal and um, e you know, extending the appeal of the Labour Party and mobilising support from um, non-traditional quarters of Australian society. So he was a particularly outspoken um, uh, a, a, you know, defender of the Whitlam government and campaigned for its return. 
So in the aftermath of the dismissal, um, White was, was absolutely incensed and wrote a letter to Whitlam that's um, kind of dripping with outrage and, and anger. Um, and that's in the exhibition upstairs. There's also a letter between Gough Whitlam and Xavier Herbert and, and Whitlam's response to that as well. So the rage was maintained by White and many others in the arts community for many years after the dismissal. But more enduring than that rage has been the legacy of the Whitlam government in the arts itself. So as I said before, the majority of the reforms in the institutions enacted by the Whitlam government in this area endure today. The Australia Council has retained a lasting place in the institutions of government and in the arts sector itself. Um, and it endures as one of the most important conduits of public support for creative endeavour. Um, and it does so in a way that promotes freedom of creative expression and protects and seeks to protect it from undue influence of the state. Gough Whitlam's speech in Blacktown in, um, in 1972, this is not it, this is in 1974, um, um, Gough Whitlam's speech in Blacktown in 1972 was an extraordinarily important moment in the life of both Gough Whitlam and the Australian nation. Um, the words from that speech have been given a beautiful uh, um, a visual form and animation through the video artwork by Grant Stevens in the third gallery upstairs um, in uh, a video work that's called Just Dawn. Um, so in that 1972 speech at Blacktown, Gough Whitlam stated that the objective of his government would be to liberate the talents and to uplift the horizons of the Australian people. And I think it's difficult to uh, imagine an area of policy in which he put this aspiration into a more complete effect than in the arts. I'd encourage you all to take a look at the exhibition upstairs and also the permanent exhibition um, and at the other side of the building as well, because they relate to each other quite closely. Thank you very much.